good morning good afternoon or good evening wherever in the world you are on behalf of the department of law narsada university it is my utmost pleasure and privilege to have uh, professor moin speak at our event the talk is basically on his book human and it is it has been such a fascinating book that i would say it is one of the best books that i have uh, read for many years i think far too often the focus in last couple of decades has been on humanizing war or at times punishing war crimes or working on how to regulate war without focusing on a much more important issue is how to ensure peace and how to punish war or outlaw war completely and that is where professor moin i think has made a wonderful contribution his prose is very soothing i would say he has very elegantly shown that how the effort to make war more humane has in reality created a world where war is perhaps much more prolonged much more ubiquitous and perhaps it has pushed the question of outlawing war to the back to the background rather than on the front and not only that his book in my understanding also shows that how the initial effort to regulate war was primarily focused on perhaps regulating war between europeans or regulating war between whites it was not so much about a global effort to regulate war maybe the colonial world was not a part of the scheme and for sure counter intervention was not a part of it before i leave it to professor moin to deliver his talk let me just end by uh, piggybacking on his book and making a quotation uh, from his book which there's no way that i can put it like professor moin has put it he are he argues that humane war is another version of the slavery of our times and our task is to aim for a law that only tolerates less pain but also promotes more freedom rightly or wrongly i assume he somehow alluded to a sort of effort that how slavery was to be made human there was hardly any way that you could have a human slavery so if that was impossible i think human war is also a sort of impossibility i would it formally now invite professor moin to deliver his speech uh, thank you professor moin once again for agreeing to spend your precious time for us over to you professor moin well thank you for the invitation uh it's a great privilege to be with you and to uh review some of the main ideas of this recent book uh i'll you know try to cover them uh, in uh 40 minutes or so and then leave a lot of time for hearing your thoughts and how you perceive uh the situation of war and peace in the world today thank you for coming so i was inspired to write this book when i heard my president barack obama give his nobel peace prize acceptance speech in 2009 uh, it was a, an amazing moment at, really at the end of a a, a story book two year period in which he ran for office as an outsider and as a peace candidate and not only was he enthusiastically welcomed by the american people when he became president in january 2009 he was embraced by the world as a, a great alternative to george w bush the president before him who had initiated the global war on terror and it was in that spirit that we all learned in the early fall of 2009 that obama had been awarded the 
Peace Prize before his first year in office was even out. I am older than many of you, so I remember that morning when we all woke up uh, like Obama to hear the news and he came down from the part of the White House where he was living. Uh, he had a new dog. His daughters were with him, young, young women. And Obama said that they were, were helping him keep his, his now even greater global superstardom in perspective. Amazingly, Obama said he didn't deserve it. Yeah, he hadn't done anything. Now, as I think we'll see later in my time, he had actually done a great deal in that short uh, seven or eight months he'd been president. Nonetheless, he you know, said that he wasn't prepared for that kind of honor. He actually, we now know, asked if he had to go to Oslo to pick up the prize, but he did. And he gave an extraordinary speech accepting it. And it was really this speech that struck me as unusual. Here's why. Uh, in the speech, Obama renounced peace. He said that while he loved to think of himself as a follower of the prior winner of the prize in 1964, Martin Luther King Jr., he was different than King. He was the leader of a, the, a great superpower, indeed the greatest armed power in world history, the most militarized one. And there was no prospect, especially with evil in the world, that he could sign on to an end to war, although he hoped he would fight as few as possible. But then he said something amazing which was that in compensation, he would keep American wars humane. And actually he cited a different predecessor in this regard, the very first winner, actually co-winner of the Nobel Peace Prize in 1901. And that was a Swiss gentleman by the name of Henri Dunant, who had had the idea of using international law to make war more humane and, and called European states together in the 1860s to forge the first Geneva Convention, which was about protecting soldiers wounded on the battlefield. And Obama cited him. And in fact, it was the first time a great leader of this kind had ever uh, mentioned Dunant, a very obscure individual, even though he had once started off the Nobel Peace Prize tradition. And I wondered, how had it become possible that a superpower could not renounce war? That part is unsurprising. Uh, but promise to fight war humanely. Was that old or new? Uh, and what should we make of this promise? Was it a reality that Obama followed through on? I also began to wonder about that as we learn more and more about he, how he was choosing to transform the war on terror. And then more broadly, I wanted to try to understand where this aspiration to make war humane had come from and decide what we should think about it. And so I wrote this book and I'm eager to tell you what I found uh, and what I uh, am uh, worried about. Uh, so I'll, I'll look back to that founding era when states began to use treaty to regulate the conduct of hostilities in war in a humane direction. And I'll look at some early criticisms of that venture, since actually there were many more criticisms of what I'll call humanizing war at the start than in the last 50 years. Uh, and then I'll look at our time more briefly at the end to try to understand 
what's what's happened with this aspiration to make war humane such that Obama could invoke it, and whether those early critics of the aspiration to create something new in the world, less brutal, more humane war, were right uh, to worry. So uh, Dunant had an early critic, and I think he was a genius on for so many reasons, but his thought was neglected uh, on this particular topic. And that's, of course, Leo Tolstoy, the great Russian novelist, who I believe was uh, uh, prophetic in some worries he voiced from the very start uh, of the campaign to make war humane about what results it would have. Uh, and I follow his career very closely because I think his worries have in the long run proved apt. Um, in War and Peace, you know, his fame, most famous or one of his two most famous novels with Anna Karenina, he has uh, one of his main characters, Prince Andre, denounce the laws of war. And uh, he, the way he does so is I think worth, you know, caring about. Andre says, actually, uh, on the battlefield the night before he is going to be mortally wounded himself, that there are people who talk of the laws of warfare and humanity to the wounded and so on. And he adds, that's all rubbish. Now, I can't absolutely prove it, but the timing is right since this book was being revised in the early 1860s when Henri Dunant was calling the European states together to create the first Geneva Convention. I can't prove it, but I think that uh, Tolstoy was critiquing Dunant and raising some concerns about Dunant's project uh, as eventually uh, represented by this first Geneva Convention. What was Andre's argument though? What, what, what were his concerns? Because making war less brutal, if we have to have it, seems like a noble pursuit, not, a, not rubbish. Here's what Andre says, not taking, uh, not, not, uh, it, deleting the brutality from war, he says, would transform it and make it less cruel. Why? If there were none of this playing at generosity in war, we will never go to war except for something worth facing certain death for. Now, it's interesting, uh, and I want to make a couple of points about this statement. Um, the argument seems to be that the goal of making war humane will actually have the opposite result perversely. And the reason is that if war were left with all of its brutality, we would have less of it. It would break out less often because we wouldn't have prettified it and we wouldn't tolerate it unless there were really good reasons to do so. Now, the two points are as follows. First, the, the ethical standard for judgment is actually shared at this point between Dunant and Tolstoy, or Tolstoy's character. Dunant wanted to reduce the suffering of soldiers, reduce cruelty in the world. And Tolstoy's character does too. They just have a disagreement about whether making the conduct of war less brutal will achieve that end or leaving it the way it is on the grounds that there would be fewer wars breaking out. And that's then the second point, that both of these projects, leaving war brutal, making it less brutal, are based on assumptions about the world. What would happen? Let's call that an empirical conjecture. It's based on a guess. 
uh, and in, in Tolstoy's character's case, it's the guess that leaving war brutal will lead war to break out less frequently. Now, this was actually not Tolstoy's idea because others made similar kind of conjectures in the 19th century. A good example is the military theorist, the most famous one in modern times, Karl von Clausewitz of Prussia, and an American follower of, of his named Francis Lieber, who also in the 1860s uh, codified the rules of war for the first time in one nation rather than an international law. Uh, and both of those gentlemen, Clausewitz and Lieber, conjecture that if we have brutal war, it will be shorter when it breaks out. But either way, all of these characters are rejecting the project of humanizing war uh, in the name of leading to less cruelty in the long run. Now, I don't know what you think, but it doesn't seem to me very credible having seen the history of the world since their time that their guess is right. Uh, it's a guess. And yet we can think of many wars that are incredibly brutal uh, and drag on a long time or that don't seem to prevent other wars from happening. And so if this were all Tolstoy had said, I don't think he would be worth taking that seriously. Fortunately, it wasn't. As Tolstoy evolved, he had a conversion experience. Uh, and actually, he embraced not just Christian pacifism, but vegetarianism. He became the most famous pacifist and the most famous vegetarian in the world at the turn of the 20th century. And he was enormously influential, including uh, on Mohandas Gandhi, who was to a remarkable extent, a follower of Tolstoy's in these regards. Now, Tolstoy gave up the idea that we should um, judge things by the likely effects they might have, um, including in the reduction of cruelty. He thought that the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus gives in the Gospels was correct, that we should not resist evil. And so he is at the start of the tradition of nonviolent ethics, which Gandhi also uh, adopts famously. But I found that in his later career, in this period of Christian pacifism, uh, Tolstoy begins to alter his concerns about the humanization of war in really interesting ways. And I think we should look at that part of his thought as the living part. So what does he say? Well, Prince Andre had claimed that there would be good effects of leaving war brutal. And Tolstoy changes the argument in subtle ways to argue that instead, we should concern ourselves with the potentially perverse effects of the self-evidently good cause of making a war humane. And if that's right, it doesn't mean that making war humane is bad or a mistake, but it does mean it comes with certain risks. Importantly, the risk is that making war more humane could facilitate or legitimate the kind of war that results and uh, statesmen could order it more frequently or with less pushback and citizens could think it's a good thing uh, once war is, has been made less brutal. And so I see Tolstoy as uh, in this later part of his career uh, in a kind of brilliant move, salvaging some concerns from his earlier career, concerns that ought to be taken seriously today that making violent practices more humane is a noble undertaking, but it also comes with risks that ought to be uh, controlled or managed if they're incurred. 
Now, in the course of this, Tolstoy did something equally brilliant, which was to worry about the prospect of the humane entrenchment of violence, as I'll call it in a fancy phrase, um, uh, by comparing his case of war making with the earlier case of chattel slavery and the ongoing case even today of non-human animal slaughter. And in both cases, he was interested in figuring out how it could happen that this risk of the entrenchment of more humane violence uh, could be incurred. So let me just take a few minutes to explain those parallels before I turn towards the present. So in the 1860s, my country fought a civil war which ended in the abolition of slavery here. And at the same time, the Tsar in Tolstoy's country abolished serfdom. And from that perspective, Tolstoy was looking back on a successful abolitionist campaign to make chattel slavery illegal. But he said, remember that 50 years ago, the most common legal reform movement in relation to slavery was not abolitionist. It was the proposal to make slavery less cruel. Uh, and Tolstoy wanted to think through whether this was a mistake, and if it was, whether the risk of entrenching slavery was courted by those reformers who struggled for that outcome. Now, as I've already implied, Tolstoy's insight here was to focus on the case of reformers uh, and the compromises they make, maybe understandable compromises, but ones that court risks. So his argument went as follows. Before there was an abolitionist movement of any size or importance, if you had a trouble with slavery, you might set your sights low and get laws passed to make slavery less brutal. You wouldn't challenge the rights of slaveholders to hold human beings in bondage, but you would say there are limits on how they can treat their property. And Tolstoy says, that's a moral choice you're taking, you're making, and the risk that you court in that advocacy is that you're actually strengthening the property right of the slaveholder. If you're successful, you're compromising with him. And in so doing, you're achieving some of your ends because slaves are going to be treated less brutally, but you're also strengthening the interests of, of the slaveholder because his property is less controversial because he's being uh, forced uh, to treat his human property less brutally. And so Tolstoy says, what if the same is true of war? What if out of the most noble intentions, advocates are compromising with states and militaries? They're not challenging their right to wage immoral wars, but they do call for them to be waged less brutally. And then the question is, as with slavery, is there a risk that the wars are then easier to sustain? Now, actually, we know some historians have claimed that the cause of making slavery more humane, which worked uh, for a time, uh, also gave slavery a new lease on life because it was less controversial to at least some people than it had been before with its brutality at least partly stripped away. Okay, so that's one comparison that Tolstoy devises. The second one is with the slaughter of non-human animals. Now, as I mentioned, he became a vegetarian uh, and 
he visited a slaughterhouse uh, and this slaughterhouse in one of the big Russian towns was uh, supposed to be kind of more humane than the old shops at the side of the road where animals were being killed and dismembered. And Tolstoy raises this comparison to think about uh, not now the advocate or reformer, but the audience or beneficiary of violence. Uh, and his basic point is this, if you think or know that your the violence done for you in, in your name or for your sake is, is being made less brutal, you might think that, that it's moral. Uh, let's call this the, the, the bad faith of beneficiaries who can be told or even work for less brutality in the violence that's conducted for their sake. And the trouble is that they then might think that they're off the hook morally. Uh, and already in War and Peace and then in... in his later career, Tolstoy singles out people who have, uh, you know, committed to hate the violence of animal slaughter. They they don't want to see it. They want to minimize it. But of course, they still eat the meat. And here, Tolstoy is worrying that a, a more humanized form of violence while good in itself, could actually lead people who, who benefit from that violence, who, whose politicians authorize that violence to think it's morally acceptable. And again, Tolstoy wants to compare this situation to war. What if war is made more humane, he asks, and people think it's okay now? Now, maybe some wars are just, but what about unjust wars that are made humane that citizens then accept and tolerate because they're told that they're, they're good people, even though uh, violence is still being conducted in their name or for their sake, no matter how humane. Okay, so those are uh, his arguments. And... Uh, I don't want to leave the 19th century and talk about our time without mentioning that Dunant's successors at the Red Cross also made their own guesses um, about what making war humane would, would likely um, achieve. Uh, and some of them actually um, answered the concerns of uh, Tolstoy in this regard. So Dunant was actually forced out of uh, what became the International Red Cross, which even today is the custodian of the international laws of war and the Geneva Conventions. And another Swiss gentleman named Gustav Moignier was his successor and led the organization for decades. And when he would go out and give speeches to funders, he would say, I'm not a pacifist. The Red Cross is not about ending war, but about making it more humane. But we can expect that making war more humane will lead to the end of war. He said, the humanization of war could only end in its abolition. Now, why did he think so? He assumed that if you and I were fighting different ar in different armies and shooting at one another across the battlefield, but the law had required us to take care, to treat one another, as people across lines of enmity and violence. It was like a first step or foot in the door uh, for recognizing the humanity of all uh, people, uh, even pitted against each other in war. And at a certain point, how could we kill one another? How could we have war as a way of settling our differences if we really saw each other as human beings? Now, again, it's a complete guess that making war humane would lead to peace. 
And I think this is a guess that like Tolstoy's characters in War and Peace has not stood the test of time well, because as it turns out, you can make war humane and it drags on. And it's in this precise respect that I think we should take Tolstoy's mature worries about humanizing war seriously, because humanization far from leading to abolition of war has led to war's endlessness. Now, that's been, you know, the story, I think, of part of our time, especially uh, American war in our time. Uh, let me mention why it took so long. You know, Tolstoy just, it turns out, was very early, a, a prophet who was not worth taking seriously for a long time. And that for three main reasons, which I kind of chart at great length in the book. First, the Geneva Convention of 1864 was kind of exceptional. Of course, it was devoted to reducing the suffering for soldiers, but most of the treaty that European and later global states made around war for more than a century was not even about making war less brutal. It was about the intensification of violence and permitting massive, really unlimited violence, especially against civilians uh, who weren't covered by the laws of war for a very long time. Uh, and so if the law isn't really trying to make war humane, then Tolstoy's worries don't become applicable yet. And then there was the bigger picture, which is that this was a body of law that was really for white Christians fighting one another. And of course, those same people were building the biggest and most violent empires in world history at the very same time that they're creating all of this new treaty law. And what we can see is that by and large, those new rules for war in law were basically um, irrelevant to most global warfare, in part because a lot of war was fought within empires, like within the British or within the French or within the Dutch or within the Portuguese empires, and therefore, international law was by design not applicable to it. But even when um, there were other forms of, of counterinsurgent uh, violence in the world, um, international law was highly racialized and it was just not deemed fit to, um, to apply to most peoples in the world for that reason. And so there was a kind of second track for the laws of war in which most global war against racialized others was fought without limits. Uh, and so again, Tolstoy's war, uh, worries don't have a basis for a long time because uh, there, are, there are no limits of any kind, let alone humane limits uh, on some of the most brutal war for more than a century that the world has ever seen. Finally, even amongst white Christians, as World War I uh, graphically showed, the laws of war were just set aside uh, under pressure. And for all those reasons, we're waiting to see if Tolstoy is ever worth taking seriously. Well, I think he is now for a few reasons, because in the last 50 years, some states, and notably uh, liberal states, have begun making the laws of war more humane in content and taking them seriously in operations. And this for a few reasons. First, and most important, the decolonization of the world. Um, all those uh, global peoples who had borne the brunt of brutal European and American violence for centuries got a role in making international law finally after World War II. And though their main goal was to make the world less war-torn war and more peaceful, they also pushed hard to make war more humane. In particular, 
without them, the, the so-called additional protocols to the Geneva Conventions of 1977, which I think are the real turning point in the history of the humanization of war, wouldn't have been possible. Among other things, those treaties are the first that say you cannot shoot at a civilian. Never been said before. And of course, we know, especially through aerial bombardment, in colonial air control and then uh, in a series of global wars, World War II, in the American case, Korea and Vietnam, civilians were treated as fair game. Um, and then it was also uh, decided in 1977 in those new treaties that there were limits to the number of civilians you could kill collaterally, even when you were targeting combatants. And once again, that rule uh, took the kind of aerial war and the kind of uh, uh, you know, no limits counterinsurgency that had been fought before off the table. West European states at the same time were giving up their empires. And so since they weren't really fighting wars anymore, uh, they could join the a new consensus around more humane war. Finally, America had had a terrible experience in Vietnam, lost a war and a very brutal war. And not only were there new humanitarians that came out of the Vietnam War uh, uh, on, on the ruins of the anti-war movement of that era, they were neutral on whether war should be fought but like Human Rights Watch and other NGOs, monitored whether war is in violation of, of, of the humane constraints that were being placed on it. And even the military, out of concern for the public relations disaster of the My Lai massacre uh, in the Vietnam War, uh, embraced the laws of war. So to me, a turning point is then the end of the Cold War and especially the first Gulf War uh, in 1990, because that's the first war that Human Rights Watch, the leading non-governmental organization, monitors for violations of the laws of war and the first war uh, in which US military lawyers help pick targets as they do in drone bombing today to make sure that targeting is uh, compatible with the humane constraints that now exist in the law. That was all a prelude to our time, the last 20 years of the war on terror, in which there was an initial, an initial brutal stage uh, in which George W. Bush invaded two countries with lots of troops, Afghanistan and Iraq, and famously lifted the constraints of human humanity, they were new, but he lifted them around torture and other detainee treatment. That was very famous. But then there was a second phase to the war on terror associated with Obama, in which troop withdrawal from those two countries, Afghan Afghanistan and Iraq began, and recently Joe Biden completed that withdrawal. But taking its place was not no war on terror, but an even bigger one conducted in a light and no footprint way with special forces, which ranged by the time of uh, the end of Obama's term to 70% of the countries in the world and 80% by the time of the end of Donald Trump's uh, term or no footprint. Uh, forms of the war on terror, since you know notoriously Obama innovated a drone empire, and by the end of his term, there was active counterterrorist fighting taking place in 13 countries, not two, uh, by means of these new techniques. What I want to focus on in conclusion is that Obama realized Tolstoy's worst nightmare a newly humanized form of war that seems fateful because it's hard to control and never ending. Uh, so there were two big important periods in this, just to be very brief. One was when the war on terror 
uh, was delegitimated under Bush on grounds not of its existence, but on grounds of its torture. That was after the Abu Ghraib revelations in March 2004. And then there were the initial months and years of Obama's term uh, in 2008 and nine, when just as he was uh, accepting the Nobel Peace Prize, he was reinventing the war on terror, uh, expanding it in space, extending it in time in a new humane form. And he talked about this, not just in that extraordinary Nobel address when he said, it's a source of our strength that the United States will be a standard bearer in the conduct of war. Uh, he made the war on terror, if you like, torture free, but also in his extraordinary address uh, four years later, when the drone program was rolled out, he promised to keep it humane. Uh, and uh, this, I think, brought Tolstoy's worries home. Not only had people struggled since Abu Ghraib to uh, make war less brutal, like those under slavery who had done so with human bondage, and maybe incurred the risk that war would continue with the bug removed from the program. Uh, of endless war. But I think under Obama, we incurred what I called, what Tolstoy understood as the beneficiary's bad faith. After all, in his two main addresses on the war and what he would do to it, the Nobel address and the drones program address, Obama invited his listeners to accept that they were good people now, that America was good, because it had invented something new, not peace, but endless and humane war. And of course, that speech was addressed to someone. And my suggestion is that it was addressed to the people who were prepared to think that the war was going to be tolerable now, uh, just like the slaughter of non-human animals now that it had been made more humane. Well, I'll just conclude because we have a, a few minutes left um, by saying I'm not against humane war, but I do think we have to take, as Tolstoy said, the risk that humanized violence gets entrenched uh, seriously and then control or manage that risk. And for me, that would mean having more anti-war movements, having more attention to the legal constraints around the initiation and continuation of war and not merely how it's conducted. So I'm gonna stop there and invite your uh, comments, questions and criticisms, but not before thanking you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Moeen for your speech. Uh, let me put you the put to you the first question from one of our teaching assistants, Siren Azabi Sain. She asks, when the policy disagreements or conflicts arise between rulers of nations in discussion, why is it that soldiers or mass public is dragged in it, even when their rights are not put into the question? Can, can you just what, what, can you just um, repeat the first part of the question? Why, why are they dragged into what? Let me just uh, make sure I understand that part. Uh, as I understand it, dragged into war, even oh, when I see. Uh, their rights are I think it's an excellent question. I think it's a, an excellent question. So, you know, I think um, there's a, there, there, there are a few different constituencies here. One is the military itself. Now, of course, uh, like the slaveholders of old, militaries would much prefer to face down criticisms that they should use their violence less brutally than they would criticisms that they shouldn't be able to fight 
or they shouldn't exist or they shouldn't have as much funding as they do. Since remember, the American military is funded at levels that are beyond extraordinary. Um, and yet, you know, there, there have been people in the military who understood that, you know, going to war for the wrong reasons what could be even more devastating than uh, kind of atrocity stories that damage the reputation of militaries. Take the example of the recently deceased General Colin Powell. Well, he was once famous in, in my country for something called the Powell Doctrine, which was that the, the military would never allow another Vietnam, a quagmire, in which it didn't have a way of winning. Uh, and, uh, and yet, Powell himself, in his most famous moment, you know, justified the invasion of Iraq uh, and was very deeply involved in a new quagmire, especially in Afghanistan, but you know, the war on terror more generally. And so you, you, we have to explain, I think, absolutely, as the questioner suggests, how the military can set its own interests back. Now, in the end, the military serves civilians. Uh, and, you know, it was, it has been civilians like Bush and Obama who have ordered the military in, into war. And yet, that doesn't mean the military doesn't have its own capacity to push back. And amazingly, we've seen veterans uh, who largely have voted for Trump lately, um, most upset about endless war of anyone in the United States. And so, you know, part of, you know, what inspired this book is watching uh, veterans siding with Trump as a protest candidate over wars that both uh, political parties in the United States have sponsored. And so they're left without good options when they realize they fought for no reason. And of course, outside the country, many more died and suffered than they did, but they, they, their, their victimhood is real. And then you get to the American people. And I think, you know, the, the, the claims of security are very real. Obama, you know, uh, said at one point, I wish I could convince the American people that terror isn't a threat, uh, that more people die slipping in the bathtub uh, than die of terrorism. Uh, and I wish I could end the war on terror, but he understood that the American people demand absolute safety. Now, I think he neglected if that's what he really thought, because as I've argued, he reinvented the war on terror. He didn't just perpetuate it. Um, he could have tried to teach the American people what the real risks are. Uh, and, you know, I think the bricks are even bigger than, than he perceived of having a war on terror, because, of course, we're setting up precedents uh, for the future anytime you fight a war. And it's, it's not, um, you know, it's worth remembering that Vladimir Putin, when he began his latest illegal war, embraced international law and complained that the West has broken it routinely in starting all kinds of wars. So you, you have, um, you know, we, ha we, we, we have a, a trouble in getting ordinary people to understand what the risks to their safety are and what the risks of fighting back with war are and balancing those, because it seems pretty clear that the first set of risks is low and the second set of risks is high. And the results of, of not assessing the risk properly have been catastrophic for the world, not only for the United States. Thank you for that answer. The next question is from one of our esteemed colleagues, Professor Norman Suazu, a professor of philosophy here at Oxford University. He asks, I suggest the Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals reoriented the US disposition towards American exceptionalism vis-a-vis -vis the law of armed conflict 
we manifest in the conduct of war. Might you agree? I think that's you know an interesting proposal, but I think we should go back and if if we study it carefully, remember that the 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 gateway crime as perceived by those who organize both Nuremberg and Tokyo, the 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 most important charge that they made was aggressive war, crimes against peace, not war crimes or crimes against humanity. And, you know, those events have been misremembered later. And it's also worth noting that at Tokyo, uh, the famous Indian judge, uh, Judge, judge Paul, who dissented, was principally concerned with aggression when he said, well, how can you charge aggression against Hitler after centuries of empire in which the West, the, the, West, the Atlantic liberal powers were the aggressors? Um, and so I don't think that those events were, um, were transformative in leading America to think of itself as a, a humane power. After all, it was about to fight a series of the most brutal wars in world history, Korea, Vietnam. But it did, I think, can help convince um, America that it, it, it had a role as a peace power in creating Pax Americana, which of course is a role that my country embraced. The trouble, as I try to argue in the book, is that it succeeded only transatlantically. It provided a kind of white at the price of taking on the responsibility of fighting the global wars of the kind it had been Europeans mainly fighting when they were empires. And so I think the chronology is, is different than the question suggests in as much as it has to be later in the 1970s and 80s, having fought brutal wars for decades that America as the leading power begins to change its mind about what expectations govern war. And it's very important that Obama is the first president who said that the, the essence of American exceptionalism is that it fights war humanely. No president before had ever said that. And that's because it wouldn't have been taken seriously until the 1980s, 90s and our time. Thank you so much. The next question is from another esteemed colleague, uh, our colleague at the Department of Law, Mr. Nafiz Ahmed. He asks, is the comparison between the abolition of slavery in the US and international welfare, sorry, warfare, a fair one, since one is a national issue while the other is international or universal? The slavery practice consisted of individuals whereas international wars deal with states, many of which do not even have democracy? A wonderful question. So, you know, Tolstoy is engaging in an analogy and whenever you have an analogy, the whole point is that it's not an identity. It means there are gonna be some disanalogies too. And the question is, you know, is the analogy credible? I would say there's an even bigger difference, which may make it less credible than the ones you mentioned. And that's that we all now think that slavery can and must be ended. Whereas fewer people evidently have thought that war can and must be ended. And indeed, no one would say that slavery makes the world a better place, but there have been a lot of people precisely since the 1980s and 90s who have argued for war on the grounds that it will make the world a better place. Now it has never done so. I'm, I'm referring to humanitarian interventions, but the very fact that some people have romanticized violence, which you could never do with slavery is another disanalogy. So here's, uh, here's why I think Tolstoy was still on firm ground. You don't have to be a pacifist, but you can, you can say, well, what about all the wars that 
were bad, were not worth fighting, which set the world back. And for me, that's all the wars that my country has fought in my lifetime. Well, in those cases, is the risk that Tolstoy identified through his analogy with slavery worth taking seriously? And we live in a world in which there's, there are next to no abolitionist movements with respect to war, but a lot of humanizing movements because Human Rights Watch was only the first NGO. Now there are tons that commit themselves to um, making war cleaner. And so in that environment, it seems like Tolstoy's very narrow and precise case about the risks that advocates or reformers can court when they humanize brutality is apt, notwithstanding the differences. Now, the differences you mentioned are of great significance when we think about what it would take to change things. One note, the, inter the slave trade was international. It was an international slave trade, not just a domestic trade or a domestic institution. And indeed, it had to be opposed first internationally and was before it was eliminated domestically. But of course, you're right when it comes to the question of what would it take to pacify the globe, that it's a completely different project than eliminating slavery domestically. But you know, to pursue it, and I try to give a long history in the book of peace movements and their aims and strategies and tactics, we'd have to have a reason to do it. And so, you know, the analogy is about that, you know, what, what are there any risks uh, in doing something different in, in making war humane, whether, uh, you know, what, even if it's, it's different. I'll just close this answer by mentioning that the same kinds of issues arise in national settings. Um, uh, take the death penalty or take police violence. Uh, in response to those things, we could try to make them less cruel or we could try to stop them from happening. We could call for more humane administration of capital punishment or more humane policing or we could call for less death, less police violence, less policing. And so I think you know, Tolstoy's analogies are really useful in thinking about the risks that we might court at different levels, though you're completely right that you know, what it would take uh, to pivot from a, a harm reduction perspective to a more abolitionist perspective would be very different in a world of states tr trying to, you know, change the international law. Thank you so much. We are almost out of time. So I'll take this opportunity to ask two of my questions and then we would end. Uh, as you have somehow, I think, referred to it, not too much, but in, in, a, in a sort of a note way that War is perhaps also an industry for some. So there, there are some to gain from uh, warmongering, if you may put it that way. So what can the rest of us do to try to make it inhuman? And secondly, as your book uh, traces the history of peace movement and also humanizing war movement, do you have any projections into the future that how may the future hegemons behave? Maybe for the last two centuries, it has been the Europeans and the US. It may not be so for the entire of the 21st century, entire period of the 21st century. So do you have any projections that how may future uh, hegemons behave when it comes to aggression? Thank you. You know, wonderful questions and thanks again for having me. So on the first, I just mentioned that I don't think the humanization of war in our time, though it's new and worth studying, I hope, is the main reason why wars happen or, or are perpetuated. There's a lot of other factors that are more important that are better understood. Uh, and in response to the whole picture, I think you know, the goal of my book is to remind us that there have been peace movements in world history, even if there are none now or fewer now. And in the end, all progressive change depends on mobilization. Uh, and that's why I tried to show that at least, 
we have some peace and some expectation of peace because of people who mobilize to demand it from politicians. And in response to the remaining wars not worth fighting, which is most of them, I think we need the same. And so, uh, as you suggested at the outset, we can imagine a world in which we didn't get rid of the desire to have more humane wars, but we supplemented that desire with a demand on politicians not to go to war or to do something about it when they do, whether it's Bush or Putin today. Um, you know, we don't know. I'm very bad at predicting, um, uh, but it seems to me that the world has changed at least until there's existential conflict. I think the coming Cold War that America is starting with China is not likely to be existential for a long time, maybe never. And there will be, as in the original Cold War, a lot of conflicts in peripheries. And I would anticipate that the laws of war now humanized will be taken seriously for a long time. Not that they can't be unentrenched uh, in the same way that you know slaveholders could always go back to a regime of having no limits on their treatment of property, but it would take some some kind of big pressure. Uh, I don't have any reason to think, you know, Chinese war, which almost never happens. I mean, there's there's only one ex overseas Chinese military base. And even though there's a lot more Chinese military spending, there there has not been a, a war that, you know, China has started. There's internal repression. Uh, but, you know, I don't, I don't have any reason to foresee that they would just drop the international war that has been achieved on the conduct of hostilities, uh, unless they were existential, in which case, as in World War I and II, uh, the rules are just set aside because uh, people think that you know, the, the, the survival of their states is at stake. Thank you so much, Professor Moin, once again, uh, for your time. Uh, I'm sure your book would be read, reread, and commented upon for, for years to come. It has been an extreme pleasure to have you here. Uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, the book would deserve, would get the audience that it deserves. It already has gotten, it will continue to get. Thank you so much once again. Uh, dear audience, have a good day. <laughs>